Hello, everybody. Um, welcome. Um, I'd like to um, welcome Christopher Anand here. Um, he's a professor from uh, McMaster. I know him back from the University of Waterloo. Um, he's now um, working on code generation, um, multi-core work. He's been doing some stuff with Haskell. Um, so I think he's got a lot of things that will be interesting to Google. Um, he's also um, formed a startup to commercialize some of this um, high-performance multi-core software. Um, so with that, I'd like to um, welcome Christopher Anand. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes. OK. <clears throat> so Coconut is um, not a compiler. It does some things that a compiler does, but it does other things that a programmer usually does. And the idea is to be able um, to optimize code better by crossing the boundary between what normally is done by a programmer and normally done by the compiler. So I think we now can write safe software. And at least some of us can write fast software. Sometimes we need to write both. For example, for real-time medical imaging applications, both time and safety are critical. So our view is that performance now and increasingly in the future is about parallelization. So um, some of you may be a bit bored by this slide. If you look at one chip, the cell BE, in order to fully utilize the computational resources on that chip, you need to put 384 ways of parallelism into your code. This is if you're doing 32-bit, if 32 bits um, contain your fundamental data type, so floats or ints. OK, where does this come from? There's four-way SIMD at that data size. There are eight cores on this chip. You need to unroll six times to hide latency in the instructions. And you have to at least double buffer your computations because you need one in flight while you're doing a computation. OK, and that's just on one chip. This is a roadmap for coconut organized by levels of parallelism. So at the top is SIMD parallelism. The check, check marks mean that this is, oops. Okay. <clears throat> so the check marks are for things that are um, done, and the half is for things that are in progress. And <coughs> the things that we're targeting now are marked with arrows. Okay, so for SIMD, we have a domain-specific language that captures efficient patterns of code generation for SIMD, and we've generated a library that's distributed with the cell SDK 3.0 because of the increased performance that we have. We can verify some of the code that we can generate. That's an ongoing problem, and I'll talk about why uh, later. Multicore is our most active area of work now. We are modeling multi-core on instruction level parallelism because it's something that people have been able to leverage. And it's really worked well for decades of performance improvements. We have a linear time verification strategy for the code that uses our communication primitives, which we think is important if you want to do rapid development. We, have, we can generate some code that we've generated basically to test our linear time verification. But that's really what our next work is, generating that code and debugging the runtime, which is written but not yet tested. Distant parallelism is something that um, we're not actively working on now because we have enough to do. On the side, we also have a scheduling algorithm. And I put it there on the side because currently it targets our SIMD code, but our plan is to use the same scheduling mechanisms for actual machine instructions and communication primitives in our multi-core layer and eventually communication primitives in our distant parallelism layer. This, is, this shows the structure of how we're actually developing this, all embedded in Haskell. 
Haskell is a functional programming language, and it takes away a lot of the hassle when you're creating your own language. So we can just concentrate on what's interesting. We've organized our code in layers. So in the, in the kernel of the code are the, actual, are the actual assembly instructions that are pure operations. They don't involve control flow. Then those can be wrapped in patterns that are pure patterns. Then we can include control flow. Um, we don't have any distributed patterns, but one day we will, and eventually user code can call into any of those layers. The scheduler, explicitly stage software pipelining, is also written in Haskell, so it's very easy for us to, to change the interfaces when uh, we have better ideas about how to do control flow, which is the real reason that we didn't want to take a conventional compiler approach, because in a conventional compiler approach, if you have a new idea about control flow, you have a big headache. You have to change your language that is very expensive. So I'm starting here in the middle. In the background, you see the um, nested, nested language diagram. So our control flow, we um, so far, the control flow that we support are things that functional programmers think of as functions that map an argument over a list, zip, things like that. Okay? There are lots of things that come from linear algebra and other mathematics, like matrix multiplication, that um, we also support. So here's map. If you don't know, map um, can take a lot of round pegs and put them in square holes, and it can do it in parallel. Okay? If you give your compiler, your favorite compiler, a loop like this to implement map, then it has to put in a lot of overhead in order to support that. So there are optimizations possible, but basically it has to increment input pointer, output pointer, the counter, compare the counter to the limit, and branch. Okay? The advantage of requiring our, our coders to write in terms of these higher order functions is that we can then, we don't have to try to recognize this pattern when this gets complicated on the inside or funny things happen. We know it's there and we can concentrate on how to ef efficiently implement it. Okay, so this is, these are our instructions in our target cell SPU instruction set architecture and all of that overhead is handled by a single arithmetic instruction in our implementation of this pattern. This doesn't always make sense, but it almost always makes sense because the code that we're mapping is bound by computation, bound by arithmetic computation. So all these other instructions are free. They fit into empty dispatch slots. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that we do. And if you want to know exactly how this works with a single arithmetic instruction, I'll explain it to you after. Okay? At the low level are the SIMD patterns um, for pure functions and um, the actual instructions. So when I say pure functions, I mean things that we can implement as pure functions without any control flow, no branching. It doesn't mean that other people might not implement it, that everybody would implement it that way. So there are many things that people do with branches when they take Computer Science 101 that can be done with predication, and we handle all those things in our pure layer. As a result of encoding those patterns, we can write small code. So if any of you have tried to in your spare time, write a really fast implementation of hyperbolic tangent, um, you might know that there are a lot of details to getting a, a fast implementation. Well, this here is all of our code that implements that. It actually implements a, a version that's unrolled twice with partial sharing in order to improve throughput for unrolled loops, which is really what we're targeting. Now, this is not what our code usually looks like because our code is embedded in literate Haskell, and we at least try to document all of our code um, to this kind of level 
where we can use the fact that it's, it's LaTeX, all the comments are LaTeX, to explain mathematically the reasons why we did certain optimizations. Um, we can put some warnings in. There's actually compile time assertion um, checking to make sure that nobody changed a certain pattern for integer division that would make this code unsafe. Um, since I upgraded to Leopard, I'm having some font issues. So these should be nice equations. And they're just, some of them are gobbledygook. Okay. For people who are beginning work with our tool, something that is really simple but very helpful is that we can use the formatting that's already built into literate Haskell to format their code a certain way in one font, format the machine operations, which they may not remember, in bold so that they can recognize them, and the patterns that we consider to be in our language, we can underline them. So it makes it easy to understand where the performance comes from and um, if you were going to model another function on this one, what you need to do. Okay. So this is implemented as a class in Haskell, the domain-specific language, and there are two instances of that class. The first instance is used for rapid prototyping and unit testing, and it actually uses, well, either in a compiled Haskell function or in the Haskell interactive interpreter, you can test little bits of code down to a single instruction to understand um, what your pattern is, is actually producing in specific cases. Okay? So this is really important for rapid prototyping. It's not very useful if you want to actually run the code at high performance, interpreting it in Haskell. Um, so there's another instance that produces a code graph. It produces a code graph with maximal sharing. So we do that optimization at this point. Then if, if you think you have a better scheduler, you can pretty print that to C with inline assembly, and you can schedule it, or you can pass it to our scheduler and generate assembly code. Or if things are not really working out the way you like, you can use a bunch of visualization tools that we have, which we found kind of useful. So this is old style um, scheduled assembly code. It's kind of hard to tell what's going, or going on, even if you remember what all these instructions are. This is one of the visualizations of the scheduled loop that are possible. So when our version of turning on debugging is to spit out 10 different graphs like this, which show different stages of the scheduling and um, pattern evaluation. In this case, the colors represent different stages in this software pipeline loop. And I know you can't see that level of detail. Um, instructions are hyper edges represented here in the form of a bipartite graph as um, solid objects. And values are these other non-boxed edges. And they're, in addition to values, data, data values, they're also state values. Um, and I probably can't find one. Uh, so here's a, here's a branch. It takes a state. And somewhere else, there's a branch hint. And it takes another state and produces another state. So when we do our scheduling, all the information is in our graph. Okay. Not necessarily the graph on your screen, but um, the graph that's used internally contains all the information. There's no information hidden in the context. You never have to, there's, at no point do we worry about reordering loads and stores because all of the state required to make things safe is explicitly represented in the graph. So what is the result of this? Well, we've, this is, we've generated a whole library of these special functions. This is our main benchmark. And using our patterns, our code is four times faster than code that was hand optimized in C using inline assembly. Um, so this is a logarithmic graph. And if you've forgotten what logarithmic graph means, it means that up here, these slower functions written in C take 96 cycles to compute a float value. And our equivalent halfway down the graph requires about five cycles. Okay. 
there's a big variation in the amount of performance improvement. It really corresponds to how complicated the patterns are. So we can apply multiple patterns in a single function and get really substantial performance improvements. Um, you'll, you have access to the slide, so if you want to know exactly how we did this comparison, um, that is here. If you actually do cell programming, you might want to know that all of the code is available and information about that is um, on this website. In fact, if you have a cell and you've updated to SDK3, you already have the code. So the only thing you'd want to know is some details about how to use it. Okay. So at this point, what we have is really, I think, the ultimate assembler. It gives you all the control that you have writing hand-tuned assembler. You have access to machine instructions. And even the machine instructions that involve control flow, which you can never access via inline assembly code um, in, well, without really writing the whole function in assembly. But you, you don't have to handle the annoying details of register allocation, things like that. And you don't have to, you don't have to implement patterns of efficient execution on your own. You can write these patterns in Haskell. So if you have a pattern and you can't write it in Haskell, then um, I think you need, some, you need to talk to a Haskell programmer. Okay? Any, any pattern that's useful can be implemented this way. We can do rapid prototyping because we can do unit testing of assembly code, where, as before, you would have had to write little test programs for special cases. It really saves a lot of time. Where do we really get this performance improvement from? It's because we're not targeting SIMD, which I didn't define, single instruction, multiple data. We're targeting what people sell today as SIMD, which is really a single complex instruction operating on a merged chunk of data. So most commonly, a 128-bit vector. Now I'll talk a little bit about how we do the verification. Internally, we, we're, we, our representations are all in terms of these graphs. And um, we do complicated things with SIMD. Sometimes we want to know what they're really doing because they're not quite working. So we can, we can translate. This, is, this graph represents a single floating multiply SIMD instruction. It can easily be translated into a parallel set of floating multiply instructions. Yes? What do you mean by verification? What are you comparing against what? Um, so <laughs> we are, we're assuming that there is a simple specification without sim simdization or any parallelization, and it can be compared to that. So for the codes that we're looking at, where this has really been needed, um, big linear algebra, things like that, it's easy to write a, a naive specification. It's hard to tell whether the transformations you made to optimize it are faithful to that specification. OK? So this makes it easy. Um, that map, the map overhead, it, at some point, we would like to actually verify the whole code. And we can verify parts of that now. Um, I don't think I've run the verification on the whole of that. But if you are doing things which involve swapping parts of bit fields from multiple <coughs> register values, and so on, it's very hard to, to figure out what it actually does on your own. It would be nice to have a translation into simple types that we understand, floats, ints, and so on, Boolean values, and see an expression that presumably matches the specification. OK? So this gets more complicated when your instructions are not pure SIMD instructions. Um, so this is an instruction which rotates the bytes in 128-bit register. When you do the translation, 
the instruction actually disappears. So the instruction was here, it's now gone, because in terms of the underlying data type 8-bit ints, there is no, no instruction. We're just, re, we're just shuffling them, okay? So these things can, all of the rules to make these transformations can be encoded in um, a bunch of rule generators, okay? And that we can do. It makes big, ugly graphs, so it gets harder to see what's going on. Um, the problem is when, oops, the problem is when you do things that really bit break any kind of sensible typing, doing things with bit fields within floats, for example, we, these patterns have to really be done by hand, and that's ongoing work. That's why I put a half there, okay? So what do we have? We have, for code generation, rapid prototyping, and we're reaching peak performance. For verification, we can do what's equivalent to symbolic execution. So even if you don't actually have a specification to give it, you can look at this symbolic execution and decide for yourself whether it's what you wanted. And this has already been useful for debugging, especially the linear algebra. Um, we still need more transformation rules for those complicated operations. Okay, I think I'm going a bit slow, I'll try to speed up a bit. This is the part that I think should interest people at, at Google, uh, how we're approaching multi-core. So we see this, we see an opportunity to relive the glory of um, instruction level parallelism, out of order execution cores uh, at the multi-core level, okay? So this, this table gives you a translation that between what we know how to do and what we think we should do. Okay, so instead of a CPU, we're looking at a chip. Instead of multiple execution units, it has multiple cores. Instead of registers, it has data buffers in local working memory or cache memory. It also has signals. Um, really, registers were heterogeneous before, but there's a bigger split between buffers and signals in this model than different kinds of registers. Instead of loads and stores, you have DMAs, either explicit or implicit in terms of streaming. And instead of arithmetic instructions, you have computational kernels, which are purely local and they're pure functions. Okay. The catch is that we don't have the soundness that you have on a CPU. So except for some specialized embedded CPUs, Whenever you have out-of-order execution, it's the CPU hardware that maintains the illusion that you're executing sequential code, okay? So that you can program it without having to worry about that. All of that is hidden from you, and the hardware ensures that you have order independence, okay? There, there are some cases now with multi-core CPUs where they're breaking some of that with memory access, but um, that doesn't fit our analogy, so. That's not what we're thinking about here. With multi-core, our assumption is that the compiler needs to insert the synchronization when it does the parallelization, and the hardware cannot efficiently um, verify that this is done soundly. So soundly, soundness is up to software. In our model, we use only asynchronous communication. Why? Because we don't want locks. Locking is a multi-way operation. That involves sending at least a signal, some kind of signal, from one core to another and back to say, yes, that lock is free, possibly sending a signal afterwards to do an atomic update or something like that. This incurs long, unpredictable delays, and that's bad for scheduling, so we want them out of the model. So you use asynchronous messages that matches what's efficient in hardware, and if you want to do something else, you create patterns that synthesize it on top of this. Um, I think I'll, I'll skip this. This shows a two, two patterns of memory access in a multi-core architecture, and one of them uses, takes better advantage of asynchronous communication. Here's an example that fits the, the second picture where you're sending data from one core, from core one to core two, you make an operate, do an operation on that data, you send it to the third core, and so on. By doing this, 
you've introduced synchronization between core number four and core number one, although there's no direct communication in between those cores. Okay? If you want to reduce traffic on memory and communication buses, and it's, it's buses that are having more trouble scaling than the pure computation, so I think that's always the thing that we want to do, um, you want to be able to take advantage of the synchronization that's implied even though it's not explicit. Okay, so here's a simpler example. What, what you need to do if you want to send some data from one core to another core, okay? First of all, you need to know that wherever this data is going is not being used by somebody else. So you have to start with a send signal to send the signal that means okay to send the data. Then you send the data. Um, on the core that's sending, you need some way of knowing that the data transmission is complete so that that buffer, that what we consider analogous to a register, is free to use for another operation. Okay? So on an out-of-order CPU, all of this extra synchronization is done by the hardware. So if you have a load and the load doesn't hit in L2 cache, the load has to go to main memory, it will cause a stall, and any other instructions past this point would just wait until it's safe to proceed. Okay? On a multi-core architecture, there is no hardware, or our assumption is there's no hardware that can efficiently know what's going on on all those cores, okay? So we have to um, build that in ourselves. Now, there's an advantage to doing this asynchronous communication, and that is that you get these reorder windows where you can do other computations that don't depend on this particular bit of communication, okay? and you get a reorder window on both the receive side and the send side. The problem is that there are all kinds of hazards. Data being rewritten while it's being read by read for another DMA or being used by a pure computation locally, okay? So the question is, how can we um, avoid these things happening? Because on a really, on a lightweight multi-core architecture, it's going to be very difficult to detect these kind of failures. <clears throat> so, to do this, we need to keep this language simple. Um, probably language is too big a word to put on a slide like this. These are all the communication primitives, and there's one computation primitive. So the only thing that we ask is that all computations only use local data. Okay? And these are the primitives that I talked about before. A way to think about what we're doing is that we're trying to do control, concurrent control flow in a way that allows the compiler to come along later and schedule it efficiently, okay? So what's the purpose of scheduling? The purpose of scheduling is to hide the latency um, in, the, in the operations, in the communication operations, so that you can eliminate any stalls that would occur. But these, all of this communication is somewhat unpredictable, even on a tightly coupled single core, okay? So it's up to software to make sure that the stalls do occur when they need to occur, okay? Even though a good schedule would require no stalls. Um, so th the second step is to have these weights in your code so that if the, if the communication is not keeping up with your computation, that you do stall rather than just do something incorrect. Okay? So that's a way of thinking about our model. The key to being able to verify a, a particular program using these primitives is correct is a, what we call a locally sequential presentation. It just means that you present all of the instructions that execute on your multi-core chip as a list, okay? So that they have an order, and in that order, the send signal precedes the wait signal that it's supposed to target, okay? That, we call this a, local pres a locally sequential program. Without this, any algorithm to check the soundness of the parallelization has to do backtracking and forward-looking and um, there's no way to get reasonable computation time. 
okay? Locally sequential does not mean sequential, okay? Not sequential. So you can see the indices can be reordered. They can be reordered in such a way that the computation is still correct, okay? Um, that's good because it allows you to overcome jitters in the communication by having extra buffering of computation, okay? It is not good when the, when the order changes and the computation is not order independent anymore, okay? So here's an example. Um, you have to actually do some computation. The computation is now just in this box. If you have any computation using data and the signals are going to the wrong weights, then this is likely to be using the wrong data to do the computation, okay? So the key, again, is to have this presentation. So what, are we need, what do we want to show? That the results are independent of the actual execution order and that there are no deadlocks, okay? To do this, we need to keep track of all the possible states of execution of this multi-core program. We can only do this in linear time if we have a one-pass algorithm. Actually, we could do it with two passes or three passes, but I know no way of doing it in more than one pass um, that would weaken the conditions that we require. So one pass it is. The algorithm is constant. It has constant space requirements. The actual amount of space required depends on how many cores you have and how many resources they have, okay? Just like any scheduling algorithm. Um, the impact of this is that you don't have to do any parallel debugging. You never have to look for deadlock states or race conditions. And this is our hope that every optimization trick that has worked for instruction level parallelism on out of order cores um, can now be adapted to multi-core, okay? And there are a lot of tricks that are quite effective in getting increasing performance out of these cores. We're now ready to implement all the algorithms that are um, implemented in so-called skeleton form, if you know what that means. Things like map and reduce, which you may have heard of. And it enables us to do some new things, like, for example, doing power reduction, where what we're trying to do is minimize the amount of duplication of data in multiple memory locations by replacing caching by in-flight data. So there may be data that is, is nowhere stored in memory um, that's globally accessible in any way. It's just passed around without, without ever being available, okay? And we think that in the future, as the memory component of um, the power equation gets larger, this will be something interesting to try, okay? Now, I'm gonna go quickly through this. Um, how many of you know about um, software pipelining of loops? Yes, okay. So, let me, okay. Software pipelining loops, let me, let me be really quick. If you have a loop with different stages and there's a lot of latency, you can chop the loop up and schedule it in parallel, okay? There are lots of algorithms for doing this. We have a new algorithm. Our algorithm is to explicitly cut the dependent, to explicitly cut that code graph into stages and then schedule them in parallel. Um, it's, in fact, the simpler way of approaching this problem. How are we going to do the cut? Well, when you make a cut, what's the implication of that? You're cutting, um, you're cutting edges. Those correspond to data values. And in a nice schedule, those will all be register values. So when you cut, you're creating register pressure at the bottom of the loop and at the top of the loop. Generally, we try to reduce register pressure, so we can try using min cut on this. The problem is that there are, if you just do this naively, there are bad cuts. There are cuts where you use a value in stage one that you don't compute until stage two. 
And um, while there are actually ways to make this make sense, um, generally we don't want to do that. So how do we stop that from happening? So ignore those infinities till I tell you they're really there. Um, so we translate our code graph. Our code graph involves values and operations. We make both of those into, oops, sorry, first, we collapse what we know, something that is already assigned to a stage either above or below the active section of the code graph. Then we make all of the nodes and edges of the previous graph into nodes. We add edges with weight 1 for consuming a value. We add infinite weight edges. Okay, Now some of those infinities are really there. And the infinite edges can never be cut. Okay? And we add backwards edges so that we can never make a cut that puts something that's consumed in a stage above something that's used. Okay? So that's the algorithm. And we tried it again on this same benchmark. And we found that, um, first of all, we can beat what XLC does using swing modulo scheduling, which at least in some papers is benchmarked to be the, the best performing um, software pipelining algorithm. And from our point of view, independent of that other algorithm, we're, we're very close to optimal. So we're within measurement error for most of the functions. This, is a bit, this graph is a bit older, and we actually do even better than that now. So the importance of doing this is not just that we have a faster scheduling algorithm, which is good, but we have an algorithm that um, for high assurance applications we believe is more, will be more reliable because it, everything is based on principled graph, graph transformations. There's no additional state that you need to keep track of to um, understand or implement this algorithm. And we can use this for not just in scheduling instructions. We can use this for scheduling our communication primitives that I talked about in the multi-core layer. And we can now do novel control flow that you couldn't do with swing modulo scheduling. Okay? So we do this. This is technical. We use um, nested control flow graphs. And I'll just give you one example. So if you have a loop, and the loop contains control flow. So Simple example, you have a switch statement. Instead of producing one loop body, um, one scheduled loop body, we produce one loop body for each possibility in the control flow. And then within the loop, we add computation to figure out which version, which way the switch statement is going to go in the next iteration of the loop. And we replace the branch at the end of the loop by um, by a computed branch. And if you have an architecture that has branch hinting, we can now completely get rid of all um, misprediction penalties. Okay? And we have benchmarks where the branching is data dependent. So there's, there's no prediction possible. There's no prediction algorithm that will ever do anything better than 50%. And there's eight way, so there's, uh, there are three nested if statements here. So we would have a lot of, bra of um, we would have a lot of misses, mispredictions, if we didn't have this hinted branch. Okay? So this is the kind of thing that we want to do, and I think we'll be able to do similar things on the multi-core level. Okay? So that's coconut. Um, I think it's a fun combination of functional programming and assembly language programming for people who find both of those things fun. It really works well for SIMD. Um, it's a, it motivated us to develop this so far unbeaten scheduler. Um, it gives us this interesting approach to multi-core, which we're now going to try to exploit. Okay. Some of the names used in this slide are trademarks of other companies. And I'd like to thank all the students, a lot of them undergraduates, who have tried to um, understand SIMD and functional programming and contribute to this project in different ways. 
and Robert and Enkel at IBM for support and for research support, um, IBM, CFIO, IT, NSERC, and Apple Canada. Any questions? How does this compare to the work on uh, streaming languages which allow you to uh, specify kernels and the graph of how the kernels communicate and then have the compiler automatically do the software pipelining and simdization and so on? For example, stream it from MIT. Um, so we could, if you specify your code, if you specify your algorithm in that way, we can easily translate it to um, this framework. If you do that, you wouldn't have, um, well, you'd really only have to test correctness of the translation once, OK? So the interest in being able to do the verification in linear time is a lot less, OK? It might still be interesting once. We're really targeting things that you won't be able to specify in that way. And um, really, there are, well, the reason to, to go to all this trouble is because um, eventually, I think everything becomes memory bound as we go forward unless some magical technology arrives. And when you do very complicated things in order to get around that memory bottleneck, um, you start breaking all of those kind of um, paradigms. So if you have this sort of safety net underneath your um, distribution pattern that just checks, OK, it still makes sense, then you can develop new patterns more quickly. OK, so we, our approach is to give more control to the end user, let them figure out better patterns for their application-specific code rather than tell them, you know, use streaming. Streaming is extremely effective um, if, you, you know, if you haven't parallelized your code. I think it's a very good way of doing it. But whether it is going to be enough for any given application, um, I think that's hard to say now. So our approach is don't tie yourself to one way of specifying concurrent control flow, streaming or something else, and give yourself this rapid prototyping environment so that you can make things up, OK? Maybe that's just because we like making up new algorithms. But um, I really think that this, the fundamental problem of memory, not memory bandwidth, not growing fast enough, will keep breaking any models people come up with. So this is going to happen every couple of years for people who really need to run at the highest level of performance. So if you had, um, presumably every time you implement new sophisticated transformations on your graph, you need to update your verification tool to take into account those transformations? So um, there are two kinds of, there are two cases. So the answer is yes and no. A lot of patterns um, don't break SIMD in a big way. And so the patterns that we have, the transformations we have, work. But if you come up with some new idea for using bit fields in a floating point number, they're not in our list of transformations. So what will happen is you get, um, so we take the, the code graph that has, it's a SIMD code graph, and we just lift it into a bigger set of graphs with mixed types, and then we try to translate all the elements of the graph into the simpler type part of the, the graph language, okay? And if you do something really interesting, it's likely that you'll get stuck, and it won't know how to do that translation. So then there are two options. Either you try to build a theorem prover that will um, find the patterns, that find the transformations to complete that process, or you build them by hand. And if you build them by hand, then you can do 
fairly simple model checking that the transformations are actually valid. Okay? The, the reason why we're not devoting a lot of energy into trying to make that complete is that um, the semantics of floating point computations are not really simple. Okay? So we do things that in the strict sense are incorrect, but are acceptable trade-offs. <laughs> yeah. So um, we're not going to try to encode that in a way that a model checker could check. We're, I think it's enough that the pattern is there, that having the pattern there documents that you're accepting this kind of um, transformation as being valid. So you do transformations that are not legal with respect to um, normal rules of floating point. Now, do you do things to constrain the locks of accuracy? Um, no. So the user figures out what the right trade-off is. Because really, um, n very rarely do people, will people who know what they're talking about say, we will only accept this amount of loss of accuracy. Um, there are always ways of getting accuracy back. If you can make something 10 times faster, you can then wrap it in some kind of iterative correction, right? So right. we want to let the user do that. And we haven't figured out um, how to make all this transparent yet, but we can, really the demonstration is that we could rapidly develop this tool um, with undergraduates participating and it works. So we could do, or develop that library, okay? And we have other code that we use internally, but. So the two levels of, um, it sounds like you roughly have two, uh, two levels of patterns. One is the low level SIMD instruction patterns and, and the other is the slightly higher level kernel level patterns that are communicating with blocks of data, is that? Um, we don't have, we have very few patterns at the second level. Right, and the talk is most, mostly focused on this MD. Yeah, well, I just, I spent too much time. I wanted to expand the other part more, but um, w we have, we have proved, we feel we've proved the concept by doing SIMD well. And we were blocked for a while. We didn't have a good algorithm to do that verification because um, I didn't realize we needed to make some other, Make some, put some constraints on what we allow people to present to us. So we started out with programs presented as a tuple of core programs to run on each core, right? And um, I didn't find any reasonable way of verifying that, okay? And, and I tried, so I don't know it's not possible, but it, it certainly wasn't obvious. But when you require this locally sequential presentation, then it, well, it becomes easy to say it. Getting all the details right um, is a little bit of work, but it's, it's simple enough that if a couple people look at it, you know, you know it's right, and you, you can do a few test cases. It's not um, something horribly complicated that requires a model checker. Okay. Have you tried your model on algorithms that are uh, something other than uh, dense array, like sparse array or graph algorithms or? No. So the, the proof, the verification mechanism, um, was only completed last week. Okay. So. <laughs> we know that other people have had success writing SIMD code um, for other kinds of algorithms. So we know there's a lot of performance there, but we, well, we have stuck to things that either I needed for my other research in medical imaging and NMR, or that um, somebody was excited uh, enough about to um, distribute and, and maybe pay us for, okay? How do you, uh, so how do you choose what your sort of basic data set size is? Uh, uh, I, mean, I, so, get, I get the impression that uh, you divide data into fairly small pieces so you can you know, shuffle them back and forth between the cores, but 
what happens when you have an algorithm which can run efficiently on a single car but becomes much less efficient if you have to distribute it across cars? So we are not trying to do anything automatically, okay? So our, our philosophy is that smart people are going to be needed to develop efficient um, parallelizations of non-trivial algorithms, okay? So we're not trying to automatically figure this out. What we have ourselves done is look at these things from the bottom up and figure out what size of chunks do we need to do x and still be computationally bound on the cell architecture, OK? And then we just use the smallest size that allows us to be computationally bound. Because eventually, that's the goal. Um, it's not possible for all algorithms and architectures. But if you can get your algorithm to be computationally bound, then you can say, OK, I'm done. There's nothing more for me to do. I don't have to do a better scheduling job than this, because it won't help. So we've approached these things the, the way that you know, you're taught not to approach computer science problems. We approach it by looking at the bottom, figuring out how the leaves of the algorithm, leaves can be done efficiently, and then we figure out how to structure it, how to structure those leaves. So uh, in what proportion of the uh, you know, common algorithms uh, can you reach this nirvana of uh, being computationally bound using small chunks? Oh, I think um, I, I'm not going to give any answer to that question. <laughs> um, we, the, the algorithms that I really know are these scientific computation algorithms. So they're either um, pure just func map or um, they are dense matrix operations, or they're structured sparse operations. And you can work out the sequencing at compile time to make them as efficient or more efficient than dense operations. Like if there's symmetry, for example, that you can use it to reduce your memory um, overhead. Your OK. For general sparse, I've talked to some people who do um, optimization of sparse matrices for different kinds of architectures, some extinct and some not extinct. And um, I believe that we can do some interesting things, but we, we haven't done them yet. Okay? And I know that other people have looked at um, discrete algorithms and that often they're not able to make them computationally bound. I mean, a lot of those algorithms, there's no possible way of making them computationally bound on any kind of architecture that you can imagine somebody bu building today. But in that case, you can never really say you're done, because you can always get a little bit better performance by reducing the problem with the memory bottleneck. Okay? That's why I really like these algorithms, because we can say we're done. It's, it's optimal now. Um, So you had cell processor as your hardware target. What if you try to produce FPGA code instead? I mean, if you try to program an FPGA with your algorithms, would it work much better? Um, so it depends what, what you're doing. For the things that, if you're doing something with floating point, yeah. I don't believe that no matter how smart you are, you'll never get better performance. Um, if you're doing something that involves a lot of, say, byte swapping around, I don't think you can um, beat the cell for that. It's good at that. Um, there are lots of algorithms where the FPGA, FPGA will do better. And um, we could target those. Um, we could target FPGAs, but the, a lot of what we've done is really about actual programming efficiency, rapid prototyping. And those things are not really going to port. They'd have to be redone for FPGAs. There are different issues there. And there are other people looking at those. Um, and somebody whose opinion I respect 
told me that, well, FPGAs are basically memory. And so they're going to scale like memory, and memory's not going to scale as fast as computation. So um, why, why tie that stone around your neck? Um, so that's really why we're looking at the cell. The cell made a lot of things hard for conventional programming models, OK? And it exposed things that we wanted to have exposed and which were not properly exposed before. A lot of things which nobody will ever expose to us no matter how many NDAs we sign, like how branch prediction works on architecture X. I don't believe anybody's going to tell us that. So we can't reverse engineer those. It's a lot easier with an architecture where all those things are exposed. It causes most people a lot of trouble, um, but it gives us these levers that we can pull. And then we can say, this is optimal. Whereas on an architecture where the hardware is doing a lot of these things for you, you know, you, you never will get that optimal performance because there are always slightly random things that are throwing off your model of how it is guessing what you're going to do, right? So thank you. Okay, so um, I'd like to um, end it here because there's another talk at two. So um, thank you to Chris. Thank you for letting me speak.